All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for the next track here, or the next uh, presentation in our Ceph Day track at Open Source Days. Uh, just as a reminder before we get started, if you do have any questions, these are being recorded for posterity, so please use the microphones uh, so that everyone can hear you as well as the camera can hear you. So, Our next presenter is, uh, is John from uh, Intel. He's uh, part of the Intel China team that's been working with Ceph for a long time. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, some of their performance work that they've been doing uh, specifically on some of the new hardware stuff. So, John? Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, this is Jen. I'm from China, Shanghai. I'm currently leading a team doing the self IE optimization, inter architecture optimization, and uh, also open source a lot of uh, tools like uh, Cosbench, C Tune, and uh, VSM. So uh, there's another guy. He's from uh, our SSG department, but uh, he kind of left it because of some emergency. So I can, I, I will, you know, talk about the 3D crossbone stuff on behalf of him. But uh, if there are some kind of a deep questions, uh, I can I probably cannot answer, and uh, we'll check with him again. So this is the, pre uh, the brief agenda. At first, I will talk about uh, Ceph uh, in China. Uh, so uh, and then I will go to the offline configurations we uh, proposed. We have three kind of a configuration, and the next uh, we have Optin launched just uh, like uh, April, and we have the TLC 3D9 SSD launched uh, just last week. So I'm going to show the 2.8 million, million RPS we get on the reference architecture and with uh, some kind of a uh, um, demonstration of how Optane is going to improve your self-cluster performance. After that, we will show currently uh, the, some kind of a scalability analysis, what are the current problems and uh, how can we make the performance even higher. And the last part we will show um, how this reference architecture is going to evolve with the Optane and the 3D, 3D TLC9 technology. So, um, Ceph is pretty hot in China. Uh, work with uh, Patrick very closely. We kind of hold like three Ceph days in China. It attracted like uh, 1,000 uh, attendees from like 500 companies. Uh, they are kind of uh, from different types of company. So, what I observed is actually more and more companies, they are starting to do um, Redevelopment based on Ceph in their product. That's one. Uh, those are some kind of OEM and uh, the traditional enterprise company. We do see a lot of uh, adoption in the cloud service providers, and it, it, it's really hard that uh, some media they just jump in and do the self media coverage. So you probably notice that uh, there are a lot of uh, China um, contributors in the code code base now. So. Uh, it start from when, uh, compared with when start to do the same thing, like uh, back in 2011, uh, the, the contributors, the open source contributor, I mean, is becoming more and more. So who is using Ceph? Actually, th this is based on uh, our customer engagement work and uh, also searchable examples. The first part will be the telecom, because uh, uh, with the system scale and the data increase, the traditional enterprise story is not going to uh, hold their data, and the performance is kind of uh, cannot satisfy the workload. So, uh, as one of the customers said, the storage cost is pretty high. It's like uh, 30 to 50 percent of their IT cost. So, it's kind of limited the scalability of the traditional ID, the traditional disk array, and make it very difficult to operate those systems. It's kind of a uh, uh, operation cost is really high. So, there are some successful examples like China Unicom, uh, one of the biggest uh, telecom in China. The second part is the, the cloud service providers. We call um, the non-tab is the interesting word with non uh, Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu. Those are the three biggest ones in China. But uh, uh, the rest of ones, they are moving away from the traditional SaaS or SaaS solution to the open source scale art solution. Also from the consideration of the cost point. And the the third part, uh, these searchable examples include like. Uh, RETV, it's kind of a, a YouTube, you know, like in US. We also have a C-Trip, it's a travel agency company, and a PR Cloud, it's a um, small uh, cloud service provider. Also, we have a, a lot of OEM, ODM here. They are trying to build their self-based storage solution. It's a hardware and a software all together. The searchable example here is like uh, it's 3C and QCT. We, 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 we collaborate a lot with QCT on this area. The last part is the traditional enterprise and uh, research institutes. The, for the research institutes, their interest mainly focus on self-file system, 
and also um, some, something like the KVS dot backend. And uh, for the enterprise, uh, they are likely to, you know, deploy the self cluster in the open source way by themselves. So they probably will um, purchase some kind of a third party support. So let's see why we doing self or on flash array. Um, the first reason is uh, those service providers they are trying to provide a high performance storage backend for their either private cloud or public cloud. So they are trying to um, provide the EBS-like services. The second reason is uh, there is strong demand now to running the enterprise workload in the in self cluster now. So what I observed is a lot of uh, customers they really want to run the SQL-like workload, uh, MySQL, Oracle stuff. But uh, you know, uh, in this scenario, um, performance is really important. Not only performance, but also latency. I don't mean the average latency, I mean the tail latency. Because like those uh, SQL workload, the latency is really important. If your, uh, if your latency is really high, maybe the transaction will abort, so your workload can simply not run. That's one thing. And uh, the, uh, the second thing is uh, they can build a multi-purpose you know, self-cluster. Uh, what's the advantage if you run MySQL in self compared with your traditional way? The thing is you can scale out as you want. It's the it's a operating cost and the benefit that you want most. The last part uh, is that performance is still important, so that's where we do this on the latest launched opt-in cluster. So the, the, the last part and uh, probably the most uh, important one because uh, SSD price is continue drawing, dropping. And uh, with the TLC 3D non SD, we believe there will be some point to that in the future. The SD price is be, will be much close to the enterprise SaaS of high end HDD drives. So let's take a look on the three configurations we proposed. We have three configurations here. We call it, uh, simply call it good, bad, best. The good one is uh, you have a SATA or MME, PCIe, SSD as your journal or Red Hat log or RockDB stuff and you have the hard drive as your data drive. So your processor doesn't need to be very powerful. The traditional E3 processor here is a pretty old one, can work. Uh, you, don't have a, uh, you do not need to have a um, large memory and a um, high speed network, 10 gigabyte probably do. This scenario, the, uh, this, is in, uh, this uh, type of configuration is targeting for the, uh, the scenario where you need a high capacity and uh, you, you don't really care too much about our performance. So in this configuration, probably you can simply calculate the throughput or the performance you can get by multiplying your, your number of drives. The second configuration, we propose uh, all flash. The second and third are all flash configuration. The second one is uh, you're probably using a SATA um, SSD, like the S3510 here. Um, the use scenario for the, you have a high performance a requirement for throughput key, uh, LPS or LCRA. But for the last one, it's all NME configuration. We have a top beam processor here in E52699 V4. We have 128 gigabyte memory and we have a opt-in drive, P4800 as a, um, as a journal or red hat log or um, the P4500 SSD as a data drive. So we actually uh, published some kind of a self-tuning in the self.com. You can take a look on the, the way we work to today on, on the tuning way we did on the off-flash configurations. So let's take a look on the, the latest uh, opt-in performance with Bluestar. Uh, before I go into the details, I'd like to show a picture, a promising result from the day one we're doing the performance job. Uh, you may notice that the first release uh, we do on a standard bridge UP processor, it's kind of a uh, UP means the uni um, processor, it's a single socket. It's a 20, um, E3 10, 1218 processor, which is pretty slow. That's a hard drive cluster. And then at the 0.86, we went to the first all flash array configuration with the S3700. At that time, the throughput is pretty low. It's like a, um, 3 thousand LPS per node. This is normalized kind of, and normalized per node throughput. And uh, then we have the, the one with G-malloc. Uh, this is a kind of a known uh, optimization to the subcluster now of less array. You have a 3.7 times performance increment. And then we move to, you know, the next release, 0.94. And uh, after that, we move to 
the NVMe configuration, P3700. P3700 with the P3700 as the NVMe drive, we have like 1.66 times the performance improvement. And the, the biggest one, 1 1.98, is actually from uh, fast star to blue star. You know, this is uh, purely for 4K random write, not for read. I'm the only demonstrator write performance. So it's interesting when sometimes you see, like uh, from the, the Broadway cluster, I mean the E5 2699, before we have uh, on the 0, uh, 0, um, 11, 0, uh, point, uh, 0 0.2, the, the performance is pretty high. But you, you may notice on the 12.0, the performance uh, slightly dropped because some kind of a tuning does not work anymore. So we have to retune it and make it uh, back again. So at that time, we switched to the Optin drive cluster. With, uh, with, we changed the P3700 with the P4800. Uh, you can see that it's 20 perfor 20 percent performance improvement. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, much lower than what we can expect it because you know the, the P4800 is like 20 times faster of the P3700. So let's take a look on these uh, details. This is the reference to the architects that we proposed. It have eight nodes. Each node was configured with one top bin e, uh, E5269 processor and uh, a 40 gigabit, net, gigabit network. And we have eight uh, OSDs here. Each OSD was configured with one of the opt-in drives and eight of the P4500 TLC 3G9 SSD drive. So we actually run multiple configurations, but uh, the best performance you can get is a two OSD instance on per drive. So we are running um, um, Ceph, the latest uh, stable version at that time, and uh, with uh, the Ubuntu 14.01. Uh, so let's take a, a look on the performance uh, first. Probably you have noticed this uh, during our demo boot. So this is what we can get today. today. Um, for 4K random read, it's uh, 2.8 million RPS. The average latency is uh, pretty small, like uh, 0 0.9 millisecond. And what's, what's most uh, bad part is uh, for the TO latency. I mean, for the 4.9 latency, it's only 2.25 millisecond. And for 4K random write, it's a uh, um, 600K RPS for millisecond average latency and 25 millisecond 4.9 latency. But uh, let me give some more information on the TO latency part the, here. If you are using a P3700, the TO latency will be like a five millisecond. So opt-in can significantly reduce the tail latency in this scenario. And for the 64K sequential workload, the performance is, uh, is good. And I don't think we, we actually hit the hardware limitation. Maybe there is something you need to tune, like the frame size stuff. But this is today what we can get uh, uh, the highest performance. So back behind this highest throughput, this is all the types of tunings and evaluation we have done. Um, starting from NUMA, like, let's see, um, because usually we, you do not pay attention to the NUMA workload. Um, like Ceph, you do not bound in those OSDs to the NUMA nodes or the calls directly. But uh, we, we do observe that if you are bounding the NUMA, the, the OSD to a specific NUMA node, it can improve your performance like 20%, especially for the 4K run performance. Then we did a hyper-threading tuning. Uh, the same way we do this because we observed that uh, if you have four drives per node, the performance is almost the same as eight drives per node. That's because the CPU is kind of fully utilized. So uh, I have a detailed data on that part. So helps threading in this scenario, it doesn't really help for the 4K random read and random write workload. The, the, sec the third thing is the GE malloc and the TC malloc with, with um, blue style and with the new release of uh, TC malloc, it doesn't, ha it doesn't matter whether you, you, you are using TC malloc or J malloc. And then the most interesting part is uh, on the drive scaling. You see the, the, the first part, we do a uh, eight SSD per node uh, comparison with four SSD uh, per node comparison. It's actually, doesn't help a lot. You probably expect like uh, 100 times, uh, uh, sorry, two times performance improvement but uh, here you may see only 20%. That's simply because for the, <coughs> for the random workload, you probably hit the hardware CPU limitations. And the, the, the second thing here, um, our 
best uh, tuning practice previously is for those NVMe configuration, you probably need to create like a full OSD instance per drive. But uh, with more SSDs, that, that configuration is going to change. For example, when you have four drives per node, four OSD per drive may be a good configuration. You can get the highest performance. But if you have eight drives, maybe you need to change the OSD per drive to two. That one is the highest uh, throughput. And we also, we also tried three here. It's kind of a lower than the two OSD per drive configuration. So the conclusion is uh, the node scalability uh, looks good. It's much better than the drive scalability. And uh, the disk scalability, I mean, in the 4K block, the small block workload is really, really bad. You know, so we, we need to optimize the CPU part. And uh, for, the, um, for the all flash arrays, uh, we should pay attention to the new tunings. It can help a lot for your performance. Here, let's uh, see uh, the opt-in, uh, where, where opt-in can help for your performance. The first part, well, we are actually running BlueStyle using opt-in drive as the red hair log and the code located with the RocksDB database. So the red picture is with P3700 as a DB drive. You probably see that uh, the performance fluctuates a lot, but with P opt-in, it's very stable. And you may see a decrease. We believe that is caused by the SSD garbage classing because the, the SSD is not uh, in that stable status. So at first you, run, you write to the SSD, it's really fast because now garbage collecting is uh, involved. But uh, then um, at some point it will involve those process. So we're still working, trying to figure out uh, what's the root cause of the degradation at this moment. And from the drive um, perspective, you can see the, the drive latency. Like, uh, the opt-in is really stable. It's always smaller than 0 0.1 millisecond. But uh, for the P3700, um, when it fluctuates flu 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 and when the RocksDB start to do the compaction, you may see that the P3700 SSD latency increase a lot. It's up to like 30 and 70 milliseconds. So in that scenario, or in that case, the, even the fast previous MME SSD, it becomes the, it become the performance bottleneck. So this is the second thing um, on the more details on the RocksDB stuff. We actually uh, take a look on the RocksDB thing, see how Optin is helping to eliminate the RocksDB bottleneck right stop here. So uh, previously, actually with the P3700, what you observe in the performance with the blue star is uh, at some point, the right throughput may be dropped to zero. That's because RocksDB is doing right stop. RocksDB kind of has a mechanism when um, it, when the flash data, they cannot keep with the rate of the incoming data, it will do right stop. But this, in, has, this is nothing with the compaction. The left picture, the second row is about the compaction. You see compaction happen a lot of time, but uh, you do not see right stop all the times. But when, when, the, um, when the right stop triggers, the submit latency increases a lot, and so your performance sucks. It may be extremely low, and with opt-in, we totally, we completely eliminated the right stop in this scenario because it's a, it's a right speed is like a, a 20 times the P3700. The last part is on the latency part, like a, like what uh, our colleague Chusa and Jason said uh, in the previous session. The tail latency is really important, so uh, often helps a lot in this scenario. Um, we have uh, three types of latency here, like uh, 95, 99, and uh, 49. The 49 latency is reduced like 20 times with opt-in, which drops a lot. Okay, with all the performance, let's take a look on the analysis. The first part is what we talk, talked about, the CPU overhead. So this is with the 4K random rate and the 4K random write. Take a look on the right picture. The CPU is like a 95 average. Um, this is actually happening on the first 44 calls. The last, the late part from 45 to 80, 88, it's not that kind of a fool. That's sim simply because those are the hyper-threading costs. It's not, a, it, it, it's, it's kind of have some scalability issue. It's designed for the sequential workload more than for the random workload. You cannot expect a high performance improvement with the hyper-threading cost if you are using a random and CPU intensive workload. So, the, um, this, behind this scenario is that uh, 
uh, probably you can only run four drives on a top bin Xeon E5269 cluster. Adding more drives to that node doesn't help a lot. And the same thing for the 4K random write. So the high CPU utilization is really limiting the drive scaling scalability per node. Um, it doesn't scale up. So that's one thing we may need to pay attention to when you're building an off flash array cluster. So we take a look on the proof record. Um, who takes multiple the CPU cycles? This is for the 4K RAM read. Sorry, it might be a bit smaller. We run proof for 30 seconds. And the self OSD part, you may see like uh, the most uh, part is actually the async messenger. The network messenger layer, it, uh, it, the overhead is really heavy. And uh, for this picture, you can have an even more um, clue on that part. We break it, uh, kind of break it down. You have a lot of uh, um, connection, socket connection, a lot of uh, EPO driver overhead, and a lot, lot of uh, TCP send message receive message overhead. So that's for the OSD thread part. And let's take a look on the TP OSD thread. TP, that, uh, in that part, um, the first one is the system call read, kernel device read, and the second one is the OP, uh, OP work queue process. The last one is the uh, primary PG to, to OP. We were actually expecting most of our had uh, OED is from the dual P, but uh, in, that, in this picture, you can see that uh, we do need some kind of uh, optimization in the network messenger layer to, to reduce the CPU utilization so you can put uh, more SSDs in your, one no in, in your node. And let's take a look for write. Uh, similar thing here. Um, for the red hat log remove thread, it's like 1.8% um, overhead. For the async manager, it takes like 20 8.9. So it's still a lot of overhead here. And the RocksDB also takes uh, quite a bit overhead, uh, but uh, uh, that's kind of uh, relatively smaller in this scenario. So BlueStar um, doesn't really take uh, too much of the overhead. It's like a 32 or 36% total. So um, then this is on the CPU profiling part. Then we look at uh, um, on the Red Hat log tuning path, we, we do a bunch of tuning in this scenario. The default baseline is with the NVMe at the database and the Red Hat log journal, sorry, Red Hat log device. So the, the throughput is like uh, um, 340K with a separate uh, RocksDB database and a Red Hat log device. The first tuning we do is uh, keep the database on the NVMe drive well, move the Red Hat log to a RAM disk. So we want to see RockDB in a RAM. If you put the RAM, uh, WL on the RAM disk, how it uh, improves. It's uh, like uh, only 20 KLPS improvement. The second thing is uh, we completely limit the RockDB Red Hat log. It's, uh, it's almost the same. So which means uh, even if you have a fast device, you need memory as the RockDB Red Hat log you cannot improve the performance significantly. So in that type, maybe the, um, the RocksDB stuff isn't a problem any longer. And uh, the third tuning we do is uh, we completely you know, um, skip the Red Hat log uh, write mode. We don't write the Red Hat log. So this is the highest performance we can get, but it's not safe, right? So the last thing we do is uh, we're trying to find a configuration where you can improve your performance while keep your data safe. So we, we try to, uh, the, 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 the fourth thing is uh, we try not to remove the red hat lock. So keep the red hat lock constantly writing. In that scenario, the performance is the lowest one, which means that uh, if you do not recycling the red hat lock stuff and constantly write to the write the metadata to the RocksDB Red Hat log, and eventually your performance will degrade a lot. So um, here comes the best thing we think is reasonable. You have a, another drive as a, your Red Hat log. So it's like uh, 380 KLPS, and uh, it's safe. So um, this is our recommendation. Um, maybe in the future, we can have uh, two drives. If you want to a really high performance uh, configuration, you can use two drives. Each one hold your one hold your 
proxy database one holds your right hand log and they, your data goes to the TLC3 DNSD stuff. Okay, this is about our performance analysis stuff. Um, we want to deliver two methods. The first thing is uh, um, the network layer is kind of, uh, uh, the overhead is pretty high. Um, if you're trying to put more SSDs in one single node, um, that part we should pay attention to. And the second thing is uh, for the Red Hat log stuff and RockDB, uh, you can expect that with fast devices, you can, um, even with uh, fast devices, the performance probably won't increase too much because in that scenario, RockDB complex and whatever, it won't be a problem any longer. So let's see what we, uh, we are going to propose in the next. Um, this, for, this thing is, uh, Internet kind of have two kind of technology. The first one we call it 3D crosspoint, um, which is Optin SSD. And uh, the second technology is 3D NAN. Um, if we take CPU um, as a center, the first, the most closed one is DRAM. You have a, a small capacity DRAM, a lowest latency, and after that is the Optin SSD, which uh, the capacity is much bigger, but uh, the latency is uh, uh, also very later. Uh, increase a bit, and uh, on the on the third third ring we have the 3D NAND SSD. Uh, the cost is much lower. Like the P4500 SSD, the cost is like a 30 cent per dollar, um, but for the Optin drive, probably much higher. So you can expect in the near future that uh, the TLC NAND SSD cost is uh, extremely lower, and um, don't, may probably do not use the hard drive any longer. So we have an extremely fast device based on the Optin drives. And we have a high capacity and a good endurance and a low cost SSD with 3D9 technology. So uh, we are hoping that in the near future, uh, in the all flash array configuration with the Optin drive, we can kind of put more TRC 3D9 SSD together to build a high performance, a low latency, and a high capacity and cost effective solution. So, the simple thing is we can put a journal, login, um, metadata, and even cache on the opt-in drive and put your data on the TRC 3D NAND SSD. So don't worry about the endurance. You know, the P4500 SSD, the endurance is pretty similar like the P3700 that are on the same level. And uh, okay, so in this way, we can provide a best IOPS per dollar, best IOPS to per gig terabyte, and uh, maybe a terabyte port rack configuration. So um, uh, you probably know that uh, we have another form factor on the 3D cross-point technology. Um, the device will be in kind of a, a percent of memory. So here is some kind of a pathfinding work we've done with the uh, percent of memory device. We try to, uh, try to see how can we use the percent of memory in Ceph. So we do this uh, POC work. This, this is actually based on a library called libp memory. It supports different types of uh, uh, user scenario, like uh, you have a libp memory block, you have a libp memory object. Um, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of library that can let, let your user level application access the processing memory device directly, bypass the file system, bypass the kernel. So here, the first try, um, we kind of uh, submit a pull request here, but uh, that thing still depends on a lot of uh, um, testing, evaluation, especially uh, performance assessment uh, when the hardware is available. So here, here comes the summary. Um, software is awesome. You can have a different kind of uh, configurations, uh, good, bad, best configuration. Second thing is that we do see a strong demand on off less configuration from different kind of customers. And the optim based off self cluster is capable of delivering like 2.8 million RPS in an extremely low latency, uh, not only on the average latency, but also on the tail latency. But uh, we still need to work a bit to make uh, it more efficient with the off array configuration. So th the next step, we, maybe we, um, w the next step, we will try the optim with the client side catch to improve the tail latency further. Oh, okay, this is actually a teamwork. Um, I, I should sh uh, say the credit with my colleague Hardon and Jim Hong here. Um, in the back part, we actually attached all the detailed self-tuning configurations. 
um, including the Rocks DB tuning stuff here, um, the Blue Star tuning stuff here, and uh, all the debug level tuning. So you can see all the tunings in this scenario. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the content. Any questions? Hi. Hi, everyone. That was great work, by the way. Thank you very much for doing thank you. this. Um, will this be available online? Yeah, I, I think so. those comp file tunings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and secondly, just a comment, we saw the exact same thing with uh, PCIe drives. About four of them will max out 296, uh, yes. 16, or 2699. So very interesting. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. I haven't seen the presentation, but uh, the 2.8 million is what is the size of the cluster? 4K. Uh, the size of the cluster is eight nodes. Eight nodes. Eight nodes with uh, 64 drives, eight mm -hmm. uh, drive per node. Okay, but in the 2.8 million is it's, uh, client IOs. Yeah, client IOPS. Okay. It's uh, with FIO client IOPS, FIO running on the client side with FIO and a LibIBD directly. Hi, um, you mentioned that you have uh, modified uh, the RocksDB to provide a real-time confection. Will this part of code uh, uh, publish in GitHub or anywhere? Uh, it's not re real-time confection. The RocksDB tuning is all here. You can see it's kind of about the, the buffer numbers and the, uh, the trigger threats. About it. And what we add is the kind of an event tracer in the RocksDB stuff. And you can actually trace the, all, all the RocksDB where it dumped, uh, it dumped out. Uh, it, uh, I see. You mean the this part, the all the counters, right? Yeah. This one. Yeah, yeah, this. Yeah, we can uh, we can set this out. Okay. Oh, uh, we can send to the safe DV mail list. Yeah. Okay, thank Definitely. you. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? No. All right. So those of you that are whoever it was that asked about the slides, they will be up on the Ceph. Uh, slide share account uh, where most of our Ceph day uh, content ends up. So go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, if you don't, ask on the mailing list and someone will point you the way. But other than that, thank you, John. It was great. Thank you.